Well, good morning. Wanted to welcome you to LCR. The fall festival is over, so no more cake walking, but we could probably find one if you need it. But I wanted to thank everyone who helped with that. We had tons of chili that people submitted. We had great barbecue. We had kids everywhere. The preschool put on great games. We had a petting zoo. So I want to thank everyone who was part of that, and um, we'll do it again next year. So thank you. As we get into the next weeks, just a few items for you. You know, in two Sundays, we're having a joint service for all of our services together, our English and our Japanese language services, and it's for All Saints Day. And so you're invited, if you'd like, to drop off in the next two weeks uh, a small picture of a loved one, five by seven or smaller, in a frame, because we're going to have, in the Japanese style, a big display of uh, folks that we're remembering who have died and are before the Lord in death. And so if you have anyone, you're welcome to submit that, and we will put it on uh, our table of remembrance. And that's going to be part of a big week. Actually, next week, our choir is going to be singing. They've been preparing for weeks uh, in the afternoon, a concert about COVID, about dying, about hope. And I hope you can join us on Sunday afternoon for this musical reflection about the time that we've been in and also the hope that we have. So we have a lot going on, and we look forward to uh, connecting with you and your faith using different ways to uh, challenge and encourage and to see how it is that God is with us in shaping all that we are and all the places we are going. We've gathered this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You're invited to kneel or sit. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, by his authority, I therefore declare you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. In 
the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me not forget that though the wrong seems of so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let heaven God reigns, let earth be glad. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you. We praise you for your glory, Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you only make a way the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the blood of the Father. Our prayer for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory. Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, eternal light, shine in our hearts. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal compassion, have mercy on us. Turn us to seek your face and enable us to reflect your goodness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading today is from the, uh, the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts to the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them forth from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest places of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those with la in labor, together. 
a great company they will shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by the brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Thus ends the reading. captives of Zion, we were like men dreaming, then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us, we are filled with joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad indeed. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the torrents in the southern desert. Those who sow in tears shall reap rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Although they go forth weeping, carrying the seed to be sown, they shall come back rejoicing, carrying their sheep. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. The second lesson is from the seventh chapter of Hebrews. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that he should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and for those of the people. Thus he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law, the law appoints as high priest those who are subject to weakness. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Here ends the reading.
Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. So I did want to tell you one piece of church business that doesn't really affect you, but it kind of affects you to the degree that we're trying to get everything back in place for Advent, because that was our goal, have all of our worship stuff back in place. And what we realized is we just don't have enough time between the two services. So what we're proposing um, when we get to our semi-annual meeting in the middle of November is pushing our second service back a half hour, so we'd have 8.30 and 10.30. The reason I'm sharing that with you is we want to open a little comment period. If you have any questions or comments, we want to give the congregation time to um, ask questions and digest. And the whole point is for us to come up and use the altar again, to do communion again. We can't have all the equipment here, but to have the equipment set up properly, we need more time. And so that's the, the simple fix and probably the best fix so that we can get everything reestablished. But I wanted to let you know. And for you, you're like, okay, well, it doesn't change my time. so. We win, you know, like it's perfect, good. Um, I think people are, I think people understand and that's not a, that's not too heavy of a burden. So a reminder, next week begins a, really a special week of art at LCR. So Sunday afternoon, two o'clock, we have our concert here and that's the kickoff of this week of art. And then at the end of the week, we have this film festival that's being hosted here, uh, Faith Fest. And we'll send out a link through the app if you wanna get tickets to attend. They're doing a bunch of Saturday screenings um, that I think you'll enjoy. And you know, it's a very diverse and creative collection of films and expression of human experience related to questions of faith. Um, and it's starting here. This is the first year they're having it and we're one of the reasons it's starting and they're hoping to make it new. So some of the seeds we're planting, we're hoping will continue to grow for years ahead. And then of course, at the end of that, we have um, the joint service with all our ministries, English and Japanese. Pastor Kim and I will be leading it together in English and Japanese. I don't think we'll be playing the trumpet and guitar, at least not till Christmas again, um, but we will be leading that together. <clears throat> and a final reminder, when you see Cheryl outside on the patio, they're still doing signups for our murder mystery night that will come after all the art. So if you wanna wear your art deco clothes or if you have a violin case that you keep a machine gun in, uh, this is the time to use it, but the the sign up will end in a week or two because you know it takes a lot of time for them to put that event together. So uh, please do sign up, and I know some of you have already gotten your costumes, and it's always a fun night. It's always fun when we get to kind of play characters. Well, I was a little surprised by one of the lyrics in the hymns, the first hymn that we sang. I've sung that hymn I don't know how many times. This is my father's world, and in that first verse. It talks about, around me nature rings and the spheres, the sound of the spheres sing. That's, it was better in the lyric than what I just said, but it, was, but it was this idea that nature is arranged in such a way that when nature goes about its business, it creates music. It's a very ancient concept. It was very prominent in the Middle Ages and even before that in the middle, the early uh, classical world, that the, the shaping and proportions of the universe were such that as the universe went around its um, orbits, that it created music. And there was a big question in the Middle Ages why human beings couldn't hear it. 
And one of the answers was, well, God knew if we could hear it, we wouldn't get any work done because we would just be listening to music all day. Uh, and this is not just an ancient concept. Frank Sinatra was convinced when he was a kid that he could hear the music of the spheres. That's part of his own musical sensitivity. And it's this idea that the arrangement of the world has a kind of mathematical, musical beauty. And so proportionality turns into harmony, turns into beauty. And we know that if you get some of the notes wrong, that the music changes, and then some of that proportionality and harmony becomes disharmony, disunity, or something that just grates on the senses. And in many, you know, the unity that they were aware of in many ways we've lost in our modern time. Now it's interesting because if you look at the idea of revolution, and in this case political revolution, and I'm talking about the early American Republic, their sense of revolution was meant as restoration. The idea of revolution was not a, initially an idea of anarchy or a kind of destructiveness. It was actually an idea that things need to be changed so that we can restore to what they were, including this kind of mathematical proportionality and harmony. And of course, for the early founders of the American Republic, the idea was there's a world of nature in which human beings were meant to be free, and so we have to have a form of government that allows for human beings to live free. But they knew it would cost them. That's why Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, had a section about the abolition of slavery, and it was edited out before they put out the document. You can read it, Google that, and you can read the whole, I mean, he writes a very strong argument against slavery, but the people go, well, we're going to restore things, but we're not ready to restore it yet, completely. And that will be the work of the generations who come after us, this work of restoration and justice. Now, I don't just bring this up because we sing the hymn and because I'm reading a book about American history, which I am, <laughs> but I bring it up for you to understand that when Jim read to us from Jeremiah, and when I read to you from Mark, it's this kind of sense of revolution, this sense of restoration, this sense of restoring harmony, so that the song that was originally written by God can finally be sung by the people for whom it was written. And you will notice that the restoration is going to end up costing the people who are restored and it's going to end up costing them things that they are used to living with. And they may not all be positive. We're going to get to that by the end of the sermon. I think sometimes when people hear the call to discipleship, they assume that everything we're going to lose is good. Well, I'm going to have to give more of my money, or I'm going to have to give my possessions, or I'm going to have to give my reputation, or whatever. But there are other things that we have learned to live with, habits of survival, that will no longer serve us in the period of restoration, and those are also very difficult for us to give up. And of course, the perfect example of that outside of the sermon would be once the Hebrew slaves were set free from Egypt, they had a very difficult time giving up the habits of slavery once they were free. Sometimes our freedom will cost us those habits that were habits of survival that no longer serve us once things have been restored. Now we'll get to that when we get to blind Bartimaeus. You're very fortunate. This reading rarely comes up because of the way the calendar works. Usually by this time of the year, we're at Reformation Sunday, so you get all the Reformation texts. So this is the first time in years that we've had this as a gospel. So I hope I pay it off. I mean, it's been so long since you've heard it. Hopefully we'll pay it off. Now think of what Jeremiah is saying to the people. Now Jeremiah, as you know, is the weeping prophet. He is a prophet of sadness. He is a prophet of abuse. He is a prophet who is ignored. He's a prophet that people threaten violence against. They even want to murder him to silence him. Is it easier for us to hear the word of God or just to kill the guy who's bringing it? Well, let's just kill the guy who's bringing it, or at least attempt to kill the guy who's bringing it. And yet, even in Jeremiah, after chapter and chapter of God's heart breaking on the page, we end up with this surprising little springtime deep into the book. And it's these chapters that begin in chapter 30 through 31, 32, and 33 that are a little gospel of restoration. Even Jeremiah dries the tears on his face to speak the words that Jim read, these words of restoration. Sing aloud, says the Lord. Now, rarely, when we think of God commanding us, we always think of God commanding us to do moral things. Don't steal, you know, don't lie don't desire, don't murder, don't commit adultery. Like we think of the Ten Commandments, and those are all good commands, no doubt. 
But rarely do we think of God imploring us and almost commanding us to sing. Sing. Sing aloud. Now is the time to sing. Come on, everybody. Sing. Sing louder. Come on, sing now. And then uh, and oftentimes people will go, well, I don't really like to sing. You know, somewhere along the way someone told us that we couldn't sing or, you know, professionally produced music now is so overproduced that we think everything has to be perfect or you can't sing. And so most people's singing has been relegated to the car or the bathroom or maybe the church. And you know, the church is one of the last public places where we sing. In fact, I think we're going to end up doing uh, a Christmas carol uh, sing-along at our bar that we do happy hour at. Uh, because we need to have public places where people sing. And especially Christmas songs, even though I love the season of Advent and I'm a big proponent of Advent, those are some of the last songs that we all know as a culture together. They're all songs that we know. So we need times to sing. So we are going to do a a sing-along and you don't have to drink. We'll have hot chocolate and other things. If you want to put something in the hot chocolate, you can. But that's what God says, sing, sing aloud. Then people go, well, okay, I guess. Or people will say that, well, I'll only sing if I have a couple drinks. If you go to karaoke or something. Well, I'll only sing if I have something in me. Now, that, that's a conversation we're used to having. I can't sing, but God's asking me to sing. Sing aloud that the Lord is restoring Zion. Sing aloud, it says. <clears throat> but there's a second command. And this is a command that I doubt you've ever even considered. <clears throat> See, I took a little nip off the coffee machine and it gets should have waited till after the service. This is a command I doubt you've ever really considered. The second word of command that God gives in Jeremiah is the word see. So the first one is sing. The second one is see. And for most of us here, we go, well, I don't have any problem seeing. I see just fine. Singing, I don't sing that much, but I see just fine. I've had my eyes corrected. I wear contacts. I've had LASIK whatever, I have a magnifying glass, if I have macular degeneration, our eyes, most of us, have had some sort of adjustment so that we see. But the command is given with the assumption that people don't see. And it's not that they're just seeing the data of the world with light hitting our retinas and being transmitted into our brain as a series of images. It is seeing God at work. It is seeing God restore. It is seeing God reestablish the harmonious gift which is the kingdom of God that was made to free people. It is the restoration for people who are no longer participating in the opportunities of fullness of life. And that's why God says, the blind, the lame, the ones who have no share in a world that is marked by strength and power. Those are the ones that I'm restoring. See that. And so this invitation to see is an invitation and a command to have our eyes open to see God at work. And it's funny because if I asked any of you, come up here and sing, come up here and sing the psalm, you'd go, oh, I'm not going to do that. That's why we have you. You sing the psalm. But if I asked any of you to come up here and see, you'd go, that's fine, I can see. It would be interesting for us to have a similar reluctance if we knew what was at stake when I say, can you see God at work here? But maybe I need to give you more credit because I think you do see God at work here. I mentioned that in the video, you know, the psalm for this week, which is the psalm we sang, when the Lord restores the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. We talked about it at our men's breakfast this week. I talked about it a little bit on the video. We talked about it in our daily devotions in the app, which if you don't have our app, we have daily devotions. That becomes a wonderful refrain. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. New things came out of our mouth because of what we saw. New words came out of our mouth because of what we saw. Words of joy, words of happiness, faces dried from tears like the prophet Jeremiah. And there's that wonderful transition in the psalm when they say the Lord has done great things for them, which is something we can say. God has done great things for this group or for that group. But then the psalmist says the Lord has done great things for us. And that becomes the transition where our discussions about God's work in the world for other people become testimony about what God is doing for us. And that's why God says, sing and see. I want you to sing and see. I want you to have a song in your mouth that announces what I'm doing for you. And I want you to have eyes open to be able to see those things so you'll have new things to sing about. And that's all right there in that little gospel in those chapters of Jeremiah. Now we get that same phenomenon 
Because it's the same. See, this is the thing that sometimes people, sometimes people in the Bible think that God's doing a kind of three-card Monty, or really it's a two-card Monty. Flip the card. Is God going to be nice to you or mean to you? Is God going to be light to you or darkness to you? And what we realize from this is it's one card, Monty. There's only one card, and God keeps flipping it. Restoration, redemption, life. God's only playing one card, and it is the card of life. Now, God has to play that card in the midst of a world of death. God has to play that card in the midst of darkness. But there is a divine simplicity that God only plays one card. So when Jesus is in Jericho, which is a city of gardens... And it's wonderful that the blind man cannot see the lushness in which he's placed because of his blindness. God plays that card one more time, which is the card of restoration, redemption, and fullness of life. We might say this, that part of the command to see is to recognize that there may be lushness and fullness of life that we are unaware of because the sensory data that we have is insufficient for accounting for all of reality. Now, what do I mean? We know this, you know, it's like when you see infrared light, you know, you say, oh, the infrared camera caught someone outside and we can see by the heat signature or whatever. Your eyes can't see that, but the camera can. It's like the Bible has the full spectrum of light beyond human vision that we can see more than just what we see with our eyes. So they're in the city of gardens, which is, of course, what God is restoring. God's restoring the natural environment. That's why the story begins in a garment, garden. That's why Easter happens in a garden. God wants to have a fullness of life. You can see that human abuse of the planet, the desertification. You know, if you've seen in Africa, they were going to build this huge green band of trees across the whole continent to try and stop the Sahara Desert from growing south. This idea that we need to resist desertification of the planet and of our lives by planting and having greenness and having the earth held with deep roots. And so we have this encounter with Jesus and Bartimaeus. Now, the name Bar means son of, Timaeus, Timaeus. So luckily, so you'll see these little details in the gospel. They're writing these stories for people that don't necessarily speak the language. So his name is Bartimaeus, and they go, that means son of Timaeus, because his name is son of Timaeus. You know, it's like, his name is uh, Olson. It means he's son of Oli Olson. You know, it's like, well, it's... You get these little cultural details. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, is blind. But, as we see in the text, he's one of the few people that can actually see. And this is something that we see all through the Bible and even through ancient literature, that sometimes the people who are really perceptive about what's actually happening are the people who aren't distracted by what they're looking at with their eyes, but they're truly seeing and perceiving. So when God gives us this command in Jeremiah to see, it is not just a command to sharpen our vision to 2020 or stronger. It is a command of perception to see God at work. And here Jesus is surrounded by this crowd, surrounded with the disciples. And here we have this blind man who has nothing calling out. Notice he gives Jesus that messianic title, the son of David. And he doesn't say, heal my eyes. He just asks for mercy. I think that's an important detail. He just asks for mercy. Son of David, have mercy on me. There's something wonderful about him placing his vulnerability, placing himself into God's mercy. Because maybe mercy has something to offer him that he doesn't even know how to ask for. This is something that you can think about for yourself, what it means to entrust yourself to the mercy of God, the heart of compassion, which is God's from the beginning. This invitation to mercy is something that you prayed already in the liturgy. This is why we say, in peace let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. And we pray it every week. But it's important to realize the reason we pray it every week is it's a necessary prayer for the Christian life. Praying for ourselves, praying for the world, praying for the church, praying for everyone to be covered in mercy. And we might say that part of the perception of seeing and singing is part of seeing and singing the song of mercy. God, you are the one whose heart is merciful. This is the one card God plays. This is the divine simplicity, the God of compassion, the God of mercy. Bartimaeus offers himself to that. And it would have been interesting if Jesus didn't heal him. And if the mercy that Jesus gave him was enough for him to feel fulfilled. 
What happens when God covers us with mercy? That's why we have. When God restored the fortunes of Zion, he was covering them with mercy. When God restores desert spaces, he's planting it with mercy. This mercy has the abundant fulfillment of fullness of life, which is perceptible by everyone. Now, the interesting thing is the crowd, of course, shuts him up. Don't talk. This isn't your turn to talk. Shut up. You're one of the voices we don't want to hear. And we can all acknowledge there are people in our society who are essentially disposable or who we don't know how to help them, and so we find their voices annoying. And the annoyance is, we don't know what to do with you. How do I fix what you have? One time I took a couple, I was going to an Italian deli, uh, which used to be part of my Sunday habit in our old neighborhood, uh, and there was a family that was living in their car, a husband and a wife and their child. The child's teeth were all rotted out from sleeping with a bottle every night. So we went to lunch at a little Denny's near, nearby, and the wife said, I've only gone to two years of school. She's probably 25 years old. She goes, I've only gone to two years of school my entire life, and I was homeschooled those two years. And I was talking to her and I just thought, oh my gosh, how are we as a society going to be able to help someone like this who skipped all the formational details and skills that are necessary to live in our world? Is there a way we can do that? I left that lunch with those questions in my head. What do we do you know, when this person's need is really overwhelming? And one of the things we do, which is what the people did to Jeremiah, and one of the, what the people did to Bartimaeus is they just go, shut up. Stop telling that story. Only because I don't know what to do with that information. And so we have to acknowledge the temptation to silence the voice of the vulnerable or silence the voice of those in need because it makes us uncomfortable. And they do it twice. And he refuses to be silenced because he perceives that the one he's calling on will hear his voice. And this is one of the claims of biblical justice, is that God will hear the voices of the oppressed, and God will hear the voices of those who have been silenced, and God's compassion is enough to cover them and to restore, to allow the song that is harmonious and beautiful to be sung. And that's what we have with Bartimaeus. Jesus brings him, and then he says, what do you want? And he says, I want my sight back. I want to be able to see again. So he apparently had it and lost it. And Jesus gives him that. Jesus is interested in what it is that you want. Jesus is interested in what it is that you would ask for. God is willing to give us a hearing so that we can participate in our restoration. We are not just objects being worked on. We are subjects being restored in the fullness of our humanity. Now let me make a little... I feel like I've gone on long, so I'm going to just stop here. Uh, unless you keep going, keep going, keep going. No one's ever said that. No one goes, keep going, keep going. Uh, let me just make two comments here. It says there's a little detail in the story that I want to acknowledge. One is it says he left his cloak. So here we have this man in his poverty who gives something up to follow Jesus still. All of us in the following of Jesus will have things we need to give up, whether they be possessions or whatever they are but he also leaves behind his blindness. And that's the thing I wanted to come back to. He has to leave behind the life that he'd grown accustomed to, which was a life of blindness. It's one thing for us to say, give your possessions, drop your cloak, drop your money, drop your, you know, your appetite for acquisition. It's another thing to say, leave your blindness behind. You don't need that anymore. And when we've become so accustomed to surviving, that we have these skills and techniques that allow us to navigate the world as it is, it can be very threatening and naked-inducing and anxiety-inducing to leave it behind. He leaves both of those behind to follow Jesus. What I'm saying to you is that for your life of discipleship, there may be things that you have carried that you can now put down because you do not need them to follow Jesus. And he will give you the sight and he will give you the song and it will be the song sung in every generation that the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Amen. Please stand.
Ooh, one of you can shout an amen or a hallelujah after that. That was good. We now confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. In our prayers this morning, we want to remember all of those who are grieving from recent losses, and also uh, Bev Bullock has asked for prayers <clears throat> as she prepares for cataract surgery. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the garden you have made and the garden you have restored. Grant that we might help in cultivating it rather than destroying it, Lord, in your mercy. Give us eyes that don't just see, but also perceive. Perceive your presence in the world, perceive your presence in our neighbor, perceive your presence in our enemies, Lord, in your mercy. Grant, O oh Lord, that we might hear those voices that are crying out for mercy. May your church be a place that hears and does not silence, Lord, in your mercy. 
We pray for all of those who are grieving, especially Connie and Tom, Jan and Janelle, also those whose grief is hidden from our eyes. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us as we pray for John, Tom, Inga, Gail, Tina, Gary, Annie, Laura, Carolyn, Jim, Bev. Also the names we lift to you now, silently or loud. Lord, in your mercy. For the nations of the earth and for those who lead them, especially in places of increased conflict, increased distrust, places where there is the growing fever of war, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are struggling with addiction, especially those who are struggling with addiction to opiates and methamphetamine. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are looking to grow in faith. May you bless this desire that it might blossom in fruit in your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. For those looking for reconciliation, especially in intimate places and intimate relationships, Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with the Holy Spirit lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After the supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, take this cup, all of you, and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us, and believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest 
until he comes as victorious Lord of all. For it is through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom, O Lord, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Sing and see the restoration of God's people. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. of Christ broken for you.
Please stand. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Reminder also out on the patio today, our Dinners for Eight, which is our fellowship group, so a great way to get to know other people in the church. So be sure to check out the tables and find ways to get connected. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.